We are here at the Tel Aviv airport and we are here to pick up Dr. Peter Parr. That's the sign. Professor Peter Parr agreed to help us better understand Jericho by returning to the site he helped excavate over 50 years earlier. My name is Peter Parr. Fifty years ago I worked with Kathleen Kenyon on the Jericho excavations. She was someone I admired and she was my boss. Um, but we, we got on well. So we're here at the airport in Tel Aviv. We're picking up Dr. Bryant Wood. Also joining us is Dr. Bryant Wood, who is in the process of publishing his analysis of the pottery from both Garstang and Kenyon's digs at Jericho. I completed uh, my doctoral studies, and uh, the subject of my dissertation was Canaanite pottery of the late Bronze Age. Well, you might say, hmm, that sounds pretty boring. <laughs> what would Canaanite pottery of the late Bronze Age have to do with the Bible? Well, it turns out that we have to use pottery for dating, and dating is crucial for correlating what you're finding in an archaeological excavation with history. These two archaeologists, Dr. Parr and Dr. Wood, come from radically different viewpoints. A religion is the belief of the faith. I don't happen to be very religious. Yes, I would uh, believe what the Bible uh, says, uh, take it literally. Despite their differences, let's begin with what these archaeologists do agree about regarding Jericho. Um, so, really among scholars there isn't any debate on that this actually is the site of Jericho. No. Well, there's no question but what this is Jericho. Nobody uh, disputes that at all. So this is the site that the Bible is telling us about. I don't think there's any, no one as far as I know has ever argued that this is not biblical Jericho. The thing to understand about Jericho is that it is a tell. Behind me here is what archaeologists today call a tell. Uh, today, through excavation, they know this is where people lived. This is where ancient cities were. So, I mean, to help us understand a, a tell, I mean, could you kind of look at it as a cake? A layer cake. A layered cake. <laughs> yes, many, many layers. I think of a nice jam sponge cake that my wife makes. Very nice. <laughs> so we are making a cake to better understand a tell. And uh, just like a tell, a cake is made up of different layers. And a city would be abandoned or destroyed, and then they would come onto the ruins and they would uh, build another city over the top. And then another one over a long period of time, uh, different cities would be d built on top of each other until you have these unnatural looking hills like this, today called a tell. This is an example of one that has never been excavated. And when you begin to dig into this tell, you go down through it layer by layer as you get down to the earlier and earlier and earlier cultures. Just as we can uh, now cut open our cake to expose the inner structure of our cake, so archaeologists dig into a tell to expose the inner structure of the layer system within a tell. That's a very good description, except archaeology is not a piece of cake. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> As we uh, excavate the material from the tell, however, it is silent. Very rarely will you find a written document that's going to tell you who lived here, when they lived here, why they abandoned their city, why their city was destroyed. Archaeologists can't answer that sort of question. We can see what's happened, but the why it happened is sometimes very difficult. So you have to depend on written text, historical records, to interpret what you're digging up in that tell. Dr. Randall Price excavates at Qumran, across from cave number four, where many ancient fragments of Old Testament scrolls were found. 
These 2,200 year old texts that were discovered here in cave number four uh, were hand copied from even earlier manuscripts and they are our best source for what happened at Jericho in the ancient past. So this is cave number four. This is cave number four. Yeah, right out of this very section came sections of the book of Joshua, uh, the sections we have from Qumran. And so how important do you think it is to use the biblical text um, and the archaeology that's been done at Jericho to um, interpret what's been found there? Well, it's extremely important because, one, it's an historical document. Really, the only ancient text that you have to work with for here is the biblical text, right? The biblical text, yes, yes. We have no other references to Jericho outside the Bible. And no other Old Testament book has more historical information about Jericho than the book of Joshua. In regards to Jericho, it is important for us to understand that the book of Joshua is our only voice from the ancient past that speaks of what happened there over 3,000 years ago. The Bible's an ancient text, and the book of Joshua is an ancient text, and so we know the story in the book of Joshua is an ancient account. So when the archaeologists excavated at Jericho, did they find evidence that uh, matched that text or not? In 1907, a German team began the first major excavation work at Jericho. They were able to trace around the uh, outside perimeter of the tell the lower retaining wall that holds in place the earthen embankment around the tell. This short section of stone wall can still be seen at Tel Jericho today. But what was the purpose of a retaining wall like this one? When I pour this bucket of dirt out, it spreads out across a flat ground. However, if I make a circle of stones and I pour the bucket of dirt into it, then the dirt is retained by the stone wall surrounding it. This is the stone retaining wall which held in place the earthen embankment that surrounded the city. And on top of the stone retaining wall was the mud brick wall. On top of this stone foundational retaining wall, there was another wall, the city wall, which was made out of mud bricks. The three teams that dug Jericho were the German team from 1907 to 1909. John Garstang in the 1930s and Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s. Using the excavation reports from these three digs, we were able to reconstruct what the city of Jericho would have looked like in the time of Joshua. Both the stone wall and the mud brick wall on top of it made up the outer wall that surrounded the city. Further up the embankment was another mud brick wall. And so as the Israelites were marching on the outside here where we are, this is what they were looking at. This stone facing wall, this big high mud brick wall, the embankment, another mud brick wall up on top. And so uh, as they marched around, they must have been thinking, how are we gonna capture this city? Because it's so strongly fortified. Referring to our ancient text, Joshua 6.20 says that on the seventh day, at the sound of the trumpets, the wall collapsed. And the uh, Bible is very specific in how it uh, describes that event. Uh, the Hebrew wording there is the walls, takatha, uh, fell beneath themselves. And on the seventh trip around, we're told in the Bible, the mud brick wall collapsed and it fell outward and down to the base of the stone retaining wall. And when the archaeologists dug in this area, they found this pile of mud bricks all the way along the retaining wall. So where I am right now is where the pile of red bricks were found. That's correct. 
The Germans, Garstang, and Kenyon all found these piles of collapsed mud bricks while excavating at the base of the stone retaining wall. Then she shows that she dug down the side of that revent, yeah. the outside of that uh, yeah. revetment yeah. wall, and then there were red, yeah. reddish, uh, collapsed bricks that yeah. she said came from the top of that yeah. stone yeah. wall. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Which is another reason to suppose that these weren't, you know, there were walls on top. Uh -huh. They're not in situ, but the collapsed brick has come down. Yes. If you have a, wall, a brick wall sitting on top of a stone revetment and it falls over. What, where else can the bricks go? Um, they've got to go to the bottom. And so with that, with that pile of bricks, what does, that, what does that tell us? Does that tell us that there was a destruction of the oh, wall? Certainly. It certainly is evidence of that destruction. These fallen bricks from the city wall can be seen in this diagram from Kenyon's excavation report. In her write-up, she makes it clear that it was not the stone retaining wall that fell, but rather the mud brick wall that once stood on top of it. And so she writes that up in her report that uh, here we have a, a collapsed city wall, and here's the evidence for it. The archaeological understanding of how the walls of Jericho fell matches well with the ancient description of the wall falling beneath itself. This find of a collapsed city wall found here at Jericho is unique in archaeology. At no other site have we found evidence for a city wall that has fallen down. Yes, there were remains of the mud brick that had fallen down. I mean, that wall came tumbling down. So the Bible says that the wall came tumbling down. The archaeologists then came and dug Jericho, and what did they find? They found a collapsed city wall. This fits perfectly with the description from the ancient text. And when you have that text, and you have the archaeology, and you can fit them together, then you have the evidence from both sides, the literary evidence and the actual uh, physical evidence from what the Bible is talking about. Another interesting detail regarding the walls of Jericho is found in Joshua 6.20. It says that after the walls collapsed, the Israelites went up into the city. Kenyon's excavation report shows that the pile of fallen mud bricks could have been used as a ramp by the charging Israelites. Because that would be a problem, wouldn't it? I mean, if, if, the, if the soldiers were, were charging, there was a mud brick wall up there, even with that mud brick wall gone I mean they still this is a what are they supposed to do I mean you know climb up the wall to, to attack so so what Kenyon's report says is that that mud brick wall collapsed off of this foundation and it went all the way up to the top of the rim there and it formed a it formed a ramp like this so that when the charging army would come they could have run up into the city to attack it. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what the Bible says. Each man went before him straight up into the city, and they could do that by just climbing up over that pile of collapsed mud bricks, up over the top of the stone retaining wall, up the embankment, and into the city. Joshua 6.24 then tells us that the Israelites burned the whole city and everything in it. To understand what a burned city would look like in a tell, let's return for a moment to our cake analogy. This chocolate layer represents a city that was destroyed by fire. Ooh. A burned layer stands out from the other layers of a cake, just as a burned city stands out when a tell is excavated. Now just as we can remove a slice from a cake to expose the inner structure of the cake, the same thing is true for a tell. As this trench was dug, this burn layer that you see right here was exposed. When Kathleen Kenyon came in the 1950s, she opened up uh, actually five squares in this area to kind of check Garstang's findings to see if she came up with the same results he found, because he found evidence for a massive destruction by fire. And he, of course, equated that to the biblical account, because the Bible says the Israelites charged up into the city, and then they set it on fire. So she opened up these squares, and uh, she found exactly the same sequence that Garstang had found. Uh, vast destruction layer, about three feet thick of destruction debris, ash, collapsed roof timbers, and all kinds of things. Now in this burn layer, both Garstang and Kenyon found room after room of large storage jars that were full of grain, 
and all of it was burned. 